Hi, I'm Scott Simpson, and today we'll be talking about the ideal gas law. But before we get to that point, we have to talk about the simple gas laws first. So the simple gas laws There are three of them that we talk about quite a bit in physical chemistry and in general chemistry. Uh, the first one is Boyle's Law, which stated there is a relationship between uh, volume and pressure. So, as you know, as you, like if you blow up a balloon, you let it cool down, what happens to the volume of the balloon? It contracts. As you heat it up, it expands. So, there's an inverse relationship. We mark a relationship like a proportionality, with this proportionality sign, the little Jesus fish, uh, 1 over volume. So as pressure increases, volume should decrease. Or we could write it as volume related to 1 over pressure. But we have to have certain conditions, and these certain conditions are at constant number of moles of your gas, or particles, and temperature. Beyond that, we have Charles' Law. Which said that there's a direct relationship between volume and temperature. So as volume, or excuse me, as temperature increases, volume should also increase. But we have to also have a constant number of moles and pressure. And finally, we have Avogadro's Law. also said that there was a direct relationship between volume and the number of moles of gas at constant, as you can guess, pressure and temperature. Okay, but right now we have these proportionality signs. How do we get to equal signs? So question, how do we turn a proportionality into inequality. So we want to change that proportionality sign into an equal sign. And the way that most uh, chemists and physicists do this is, is they introduce a constant. By plugging in a constant, bam, you have an equals. So for example, volume is related to the inverse of pressure. We could change that to an equality. I'm just slapping in some constant. We're going to call this k sub 1. Our Charles law we can group together. We can change it from a proportionality. We'll say volume is equal to k2 times t. So they're related to one another. And then finally, we can have Avogadro's law where we're switching from volume. We'll call this k3 to number of moles. Okay, but this is too many laws. Personally, I hate memorizing things. Um, three laws, that takes up more valuable brain space than we need. We can condense all of these into one single grand unified law. So what we're going to do here is, is we're going to isolate um, volume. We're going to combine all of these equations together, and we're going to see what we get. Okay, so uh, in that case, what we should find is, is volume is equal to k1 times k2 times k3, 1 over p times t times n, right? Well, we have a collection, an ensemble of constants right along here. All we have to do is just combine those things together, and we can call it a new constant. In this case, we're going to call it r. So we have r, if we sub everything, or move everything around, shuffle it around, and get t, n over p. If we manipulate that a little bit, it's probably more familiar to you from general chemistry to be uh, uh, pv equals nrt, or the ideal gas law. Cool. So we took those simple gas laws that were proportionalities, turn them into inequalities, and now we end up at the simple, or the ideal gas law. Or the perfect gas law, depending on who you talk to. So, uh, there are some assumptions we make with this perfect gas law, though. Let's talk about those assumptions and how we can use this equation to state 
this new ideal gas law um, because it's going to come up a ton throughout the course in physical chemistry and if you're watching this from general chemistry. We use it for a chapter or two. So the ideal gas law. This is sometimes called the perfect gas law, as we said. There are several assumptions that we have. The first assumption is, is that collisions between the gas particles uh, and the walls of the container are elastic. So collisions of gas particles are elastic. And what does elastic mean? As they bounce off, there's no energy that's being transferred at all. Uh, the second assumption we make is, is they, that the gas particles occupy no space. Occupy no space. Of course, we know that this isn't true. They have to occupy some space, but we're going to say the amount of space that they can hold is negligible. Then, three, the gas particles do not attract one another through intermolecular attraction forces such as Van der Waals forces, dipole, dipole, or um, uh, hydrogen bonds. So gas particles do not attract each other. Fourth is the gas particles are in ceaseless random motion. Are in ceaseless random motion. Which isn't quite true, especially if they have these attractive forces, they're going to follow some sort of pattern. Um, but all of this comes from the kinetic. Uh, model of gases, so uh, we're going to keep with these assumptions. We do know that some of these are flawed, for example, number two, there's no way that that can be true, but we just go with it. But let's ask the question then, when does a gas behave most ideally? This is where we want our assumptions to be true. So we have to think of different experimental conditions where we can try to make these assumptions as true as possible. So uh, let's see, we want them to be in ceaseless random motion. Um, we want the particles to have elastic collisions. So if we can think about an experimental setup where that happens, that would be high temperature. The more random motion you have, the better off, or the more true these assumptions are. So, uh, we need the gas particles moving fast. Fast. So that's going to be a high temperature. And now we need to say that the gas particles occupy no space and they do not attract. So, under those conditions, we want the particles to be far apart from one another. So the gas particles... need to be far apart. So if we visualize our gas particles contained within a container and they're bouncing around, we want to stop those collisions from happening. And we also do not want them to, to occupy an overall average space. So if we increase the volume or we decrease the pressure, that is going to be favorable. So low pressure. And under those set of conditions, we should be able to get um, as close to ideality as possible. All right, so that's all we're going to discuss for the ideal gas law and the simple gas laws. Um, if you have any questions, please leave any comments below. Thank you.